Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 AP English, the World of Ideas Lectures. We are in Unit Number 5, Nature, and we are now in Lecture Number 27, Darwin. And the title of this cutting is Natural Selection from, actually, the Origin of Species uh, by Means of Natural Selection. We're working with the first edition. I just want to point out the value of the footnotes in Jacobus. Look on page 397 real quickly in his introductory comments to Darwin. He says, this text is from the first edition published in 1859. In the five subsequent editions, Darwin hedged more and more on his theory, often introducing material in defense against objections. The first edition is vigorous and direct. This edition jolted the worlds of science and religion out of their complacence. In later editions, this chapter was titled Natural Selection or Survival of the Fittest. Now, uh, if, if you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, and let's start talking about some of the assumptions behind this lecture. LearnStrong.net, I'm hoping that you've been following our lectures in the AP folder, World of Ideas folders, lectures 1 through 26. But I've already given a series of comments, lectures, on uh, the uh, uh, text here in the Harvard Classics uh, folder. So if you'll go to learnstrong.net or provided for you in the World of Ideas list there, my assumption in, in lecturing this material is that you will have already studied that information, the Harvard Classics lecture number 71, it's titled, in uh, Introductions of Darwin and Darwinian Thought, especially as it relates to Origin of Species. My other assumption is that you've been following our stuff and understand our learning theory. The desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. We're not here to debate the legitimacy or illegitimacy of ideas until we actually understand what those ideas are. Now, of course, we're going to engage in this learning activity in our reading through active reading, annotation, and therefore we're going to try to answer always at three levels, three guiding questions. What does the text say? What does the text uh, mean? Here we'll ask it to a themes messages as well as our big five. Um, what does this text say about epistemology, what we can know, ontology, who we are, psychology, the study of the individual mind, sociology, the study of collective minds, and theodicy, the question of evil or suffering in the world, something that troubled Darwin immensely in all of his, in all of his uh, writing. And then uh, we'll be looking at 2B, rhetoric and the like, uh, as, as we work at level 2. At level 3, we answer the question, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? First of all, to other titles that I know of, and then finally to myself. And then finally, the assumption is that you've read this material on your own and then come to use me. Mortimer Adler argues in How to Read a Book, a sacred text of 303, uh, that reading in the sciences is different from reading in the humanities. It's a really important insight. And reading Darwin is a classic example in, uh, in his book, How to Read a Book, the very, uh, the very table of contents of Origin of Species is the ones that studied. It's really, it's really important that you learn how to read in the different disciplines. And so I really want to challenge you to read this material on your own before you come to me and let me help you with this. The brief biography, and again, I'm, this is going to be very brief because my assumption is you've already watched my lecture on Darwin and so you know the, the kind of ins and outs of a lot of his biography. It's such an important biography to understanding the work of Darwin. His dates, 1809 to 1882, he was formally trained as a minister, so he knew his biblical text well, right, okay? So for people who say, for example, Darwin was some atheist who didn't know, uh, you know, biblical and Christian uh, theology, way wrong, right, way wrong. He is the grandson, of course, of Erasmus Darwin. The HMS Beagle trip uh, to South America and the Galapagos is, of course, central to what happens 1831 to 1836. Some have called them the four or five most important years in the history of the world, right? I'll, that seems hyperbolic to me. I'll let you figure that one out. Jacob is introducing Darwin and his ideas on page 397 to 398. I'll just let Jacob do his job here. Ultimately, Darwin concluded, I'm just reading at the bottom of 397, ultimately Darwin concluded that varieties in nature were caused by three forces. One, natural selection, in which varieties often spontaneously by chance, but, uh, uh, but then are selected for because they are aids to survival. Two, direct action of the environment, in which non-adaptive varieties 
do not survive because of climate, food, con and, uh, food conditions, or the like. Three, the effects of use or disuse of a variation. For example, the short beak of a bird in paragraph number nine, for example. Darwin later regarded sexual selection, which figures prominently in this work, as less significant. Just to skip down a few lines, Darwin did not mention human beings as part of the evolutionary process in On the Origin of Species because he was particularly concerned about the probable adverse reactions of theologians. He merely promised later discussion of that subject and of course it finally came in his classic Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex in 1871, the companion to On the Origin of Species. It is my hope that your reading here will turn you towards Descent of Man, which I think any informed individual needs to have read and studied that text closely to understand actually what Darwin says in that text. The words that he uses often, the words that he doesn't use very often. It's quite interesting the number of times the word love gets used, for example. You can go and study that on your own. Just to finish with Jacobus, the descent of man, since we're talking about it, stirred up a great deal of controversy between the church, obviously, and Darwin's supporters. Not since the Roman Catholic Church denied the fact that the earth went round the sun, which Galileo proved scientifically, of course, in 1632, and was placed under house arrest for his pains, had there been a more serious confrontation between science and religion. Darwin was ridiculed by ministers, doubted by older scientists, but his views were stoutly defended by younger scientists, many of whom had arrived at similar conclusions. In the end, Darwin's views, of course, were accepted by the Church of England, and when he died in 82, 1882, he was lionized and buried in Westminster Abbey in London. Only recently, Jacobus points out, has controversy concerning his work arisen again. Let's turn now to Darwin's rhetoric real quickly. I'm with you on page 399. One of the important things that Jacobus points out is the genius in which Darwin can yoke thesis and demonstration so well. If you want to be a good writer, study the way Darwin does it. Interestingly enough, now just reading Jacobus, Darwin claimed that he used Francis Bacon's method of induction, go back to our prior lecture if, if, if you don't know what we're talking about there, in his researchers, in his, in his researches gathering evidence of many instances of a given phenomenon from which the truth or natural law emerges. In fact, Jacobus argues, Darwin did not quite follow this path. Like most modern scientists, he established a hypothesis after a period of observation and then he looked for evidence that confirmed or refuted the hypothesis. He was careful to include examples that argued against his view, but like most scientists, he emphasized the importance of the support of samples. Induction plays a part in the rhetoric of this selection in that it is dominated by examples from bird breeding, birds in nature, domestic farm animals and their breeding, and botany including the breeding of plants, the interdependence of certain insects and certain plants. All right? Um, let's now turn to a paragraph summary of this text quickly. And again, this very passage is one that I've, that I've discussed in an earlier lecture, so I'll be able to move rather quickly through this information. Paragraphs 1 and 2. The principle of selection applies in nature as in human-controlled breeding. Man cannot create the numerous variations we see in domesticated species, but can only preserve and accumulate those that occur. Given how many variations have benefited, and been fostered by man, we must assume that many more occur than benefit the being in question and are fostered by the survival advantage they confer. This presentation of favorable individual differences and variations and, of course, destruction of injurious ones comprises natural selection or the survival of the fittest. Natural selection does not refer to vol violation or, or deity, uh, uh, of volition or deity but merely to the action and result of natural laws. So right away, obviously, Darwin is going to begin to challenge certain theological principles. Paragraphs three through four. Any change in a given environment opens a niche for different species migrating in from the outside or for variations in resident species, which adapt them better to their altered surroundings. Changing conditions appear to increase irritability. Adaption occurs even in a constant environment, however, for no species is ever perfectly suited to its locale. Paragraphs 5 through 7. Man selects only those variations he can see and utilize, while nature can act on any aspect of an organism at any level of subtlety and in any way that may improve the organism's ability to exploit its environment. Natural selection is constant, though we see it only when changes accumulate over time and become visible. 
For significant modification to occur, the initial favorable variation must be followed by others. Paragraphs 8 through 12. Natural selection operates even on characters and structures that appear minor to us, as these may significantly affect an organism's survival advantage, and it can work in directions we cannot anticipate. Variations can affect creatures at any stage of their life and can change the relation of offspring to parent. Favorably adapted creatures do not always survive, but natural selection never perpetuates a variation that confers no advantage. It's a cardinal understanding of Darwinian evolution. Paragraphs 13 through 15. Nature, like man, often alters males and females differently within a species. A variation may benefit a creature over others of its species. This sexual selection operates not by conferring a direct survival advantage, but by increasing the individual's chances of producing offspring. Stronger males and those more attractive to females are more likely to pass on their characteristics to the next generation. Paragraphs 16 through 18. Variations are perpetuated that occur in numerous members of a species rather than just one. For a single individual, however well adapted, has little chance of passing on a trait to whole succeeding generations. Even if a particular advent advantageous trait is not transmitted to offspring, however, a tendency to variety in that manner may gradually strengthen within the species. Paragraph 19. Because most plants and animals stay close to home, any modification tends to occur locally at first, spreading wider insofar as it confers an advantage over other nearby populations. To finish, paragraphs 20 through 22, a variation that does not benefit the creature directly may be perpetuated if it increases the species' chance of reproducing. It's when a plant yields nectar in such a way as to attract more pollinating insects. Characteristics such as sexual dimorphism may arise in this way. At the same time as a plant species, variations make it more attractive to bees. The bee's species is likely to vary so as to adapt better to its changing food source. Finally, paragraph 23, modern geology has banished the instant evacuation of great valleys by huge waves in favor of the long-term cumulative action of ordinary visible forces. So too will natural selection banish the belief that new beings are continually created or suddenly modified. Now, as we say in our earlier lectures on Darwin that I hope you've already seen, Darwin was working without the advantage of the knowledge of genetics that, of course, we today possess. Let's jump now really quickly to levels two and three. What are we going to say about our big five? Well, what does this text say about epistemology and what we can know? It is clear that Darwin is arguing in all of Origin of Species, as we say in our earlier lectures, for the fallibilist position epistemologically as opposed to the absolutist position. I know and I'm absolutely certain the scientific epistemological approach is rather fallibilism. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. Let's look for more data. And until we find data to disprove our position, epistemologically, we're going to hold this fallibilist position. We're certainly not going to hold a relativist position that there is no truth. Darwin never held a position like that. He argued, of course, for a fallibilist position. Ontologically, what are we looking at with this text? Well, we are an evolved species, no question. And yet, at the same time, what are we ontologically? Well, we're curious. We want to know. We need to understand things. And because we're this way, we're going to keep asking questions until we come up with the right answers. What does this text say about psychology? Well, obviously, fear can be a useful tool. No question about it in the evolution of the species. We have to overcome anxieties, no question. Sociologically, this text seems to suggest that we are, of course, a species that must survive together, without doubt, without question. Darwin would argue we're all in this thing together. It's one of the tragedies that, of course, social Darwinianism came to be applied to eugenics projects and the likes of the, and the like of the late 19th, 20th century, of course, and sadly even continuing into the 21st century. Darwin would, I think, have been appalled at this idea because he would have argued sociologically we're all in this thing together. We either rise or we fall together, no question. Which leads us, of course, to the question of theodicy and no doubt the question is, why did this happen again for us, not to us, as a species that is involving growing and learning? Two A messages. Well, I think Darwin clearly is making the argument in Origin of Species, as we said in the earlier lecture, that nature is a mysterious and complex thing, no question about it. We can't just assume we know everything, right? There should be a bit of humbling that's there. 
However, it can be investigated and possibly understood, certainly in some ways manipulated if one understands nature well, but one must be very careful even about that. We think, of, of course, of the questions, the ethical questions of genetic engineering and where Darwin would have come down on this. I think he would have been very concerned about some of the uh, you know, a, uh, optimism that's associated with some of these views. Finally, of course, we said it already, I think this is the heart of Darwinian uh, views, and that is we're all in this together. There has to be an understanding that we live on, we cohabitate on this planet. We are, in fact, a species that must, more than anything, recognize the importance of everyone within the species. And to be noticed, the use of the, the powerful use of examples. The language is beautifully, beautifully constructed. Darwin was a real genius, as I've said in earlier lectures, uh, in, in his prose. At 3A, well, we, so many titles that we can mention from Plato and Aristotle on. I'll just mention this, uh, this referencing to Bacon and Bacon's induction method as opposed to the way that Darwin will approach the whole idea, the whole idea from a more scientific perspective with, again, the hypotheses. Finally, in 3B, we're, we're talking about struggle, but let's, let's apply it to ourselves. What is a time that you had to really struggle to get through an experience, come out on the other side, and you were somehow, can we use this term, evolved? You were different. You were changed in some way, trying to relate this information to you personally. Of course, one of the 3B questions that always seems to come to mind anytime Darwin comes up is the question regarding religion versus science. I think it is a dubious distinction, as we have often argued in 303, because early science is in fact religion, and early religion is in fact science. They are symbiotic. Religion just simply means anything that is done repeated over and over. To, to, to write religiously means you do it a lot. Is that right? As we have said. Therefore, to do science well is repeated, and therefore religious. Now, obviously, we can have scientism, just like we can have a certain kind of fanatical view of religion, that epistemologically lives in that absolutist strand of that continuum. We've got to be very, very careful about that, don't we? Obviously, there are some absolutes. You ain't met no 200-year-old person. Will that be an absolute in 2,000 years? Who knows? Darwin would say, who knows? I hope you've enjoyed our study of Darwin. Thank you.